I believe that I'm one of the first TED speaker who's actually from prison. Yes, I have been in prison for eight years of my life, from the age of 18 to the age of 26, behind bars. Because of gang fights, because of stabbing a guy, because of slashing, and six rioting offences. It has been five years since I last released from prison. Last time, I lost everything. I lost my family. I lost my friends. I lost my education. I lost everything. The worst part of it all, I lost my best friend. Right in front of where we were, we were ambushed by three gangs. And we was, he got slaughtered. And they take the knife and just plunge it in his chest and just drag it down all the way. 19 years old, he died two hours later. And from there, I took revenge and I went to prison. And I was in prison for a long time. But it was also then, I started to pick up education. I started to believe there is hope for me. Right, and I, so on that process, you know, last time when I was out there, I loved my secondary three years so much when I was studying in school, because I was in it for three long years. All three years failed. <laughs> right? But when I came in, I started to pick up education. I did my N-levels, O-levels, A-levels, all behind the prison walls. And I was so glad, actually, when I was accepted into Singapore Management University. And I did my double majors here, and graduated in psychology and human resources. And on top of that blessings, I want to run through some of my other blessings that I've been experiencing and enjoying for the past five years. One of the big things that I've been enjoying uh, for the past five to six years, I have been in, covered by media. If you have been seeing uh, papers, you will always see me, if you do see papers. Right? So let me run through some of them. Uh, firstly, I've also been given two international awards this year. Duke of Edinburgh Award in UK and 10 Outstanding Young Person Award through US. And on top of that, like I said, this is me, right? I know I look a bit different right now, but that was me in 2008, right? So that's me in 2009, and I was covered in TV as well. 2010, I received a Stars of Shine National Award in Singapore, right? And I was covered in papers. 2011, I was in Channel News Asia. My story was covered again in TV. And 2012, I was in Channel 5, Confessions of Crime, and of course, this year, 2013, for my awards and all. This is, on top of that, I'm also enjoying the privilege of serving the society. Yes, I have a wonderful story, and I've been doing a lot of things in Singapore and beyond. And one of the best part of it all is that my story is not just something that changes life, it saves lives. I have people come to me and tell me, you know, David, I was about to commit suicide. And it happened more than once. But your story has given me hope to go on again. And that makes me blessed with what I am. Now, telling you about my story, now, if you have looked about me, you know, if you know me, 13 years back, when I was a young kid, an at-risk youth, the way you define me, with one word, one special word, and this is how you will go, you will say, Impossible, uh, this guy cannot make it in life one. Impossible, right? In other words, it defines you cannot make it. But right now, at where you're sitting, or where you're seeing me, this is how you'll define me. With the same word, you will say, impossible. Are you sure, David, you have such a past? You see, it's the same word, but different meaning. And that's where I want to bring the idea that sometimes a certain word can be defined in a different way. Today, I'm here to talk a lot about youth at risk. And they have been defined in a very different way by a lot of people. They have been defined as, or must be involved in crime, must come from a divorced family, show rebellious one. Right? See, you, these are the usual definitions that we have of a youth at risk. And so, when we work with them, we struggle. You see, if you look at my life, perceptions change when people change. When I change, people start to accept me. Right? I believe it should be the other way around. It should be that 
perceptions must change in order for people to change. So instead of us always waiting for people to change, we should start accepting them first. Let me tell you a bit more on this topic, right? If you know Singapore education system, we have an interesting streaming, right? There are four main types of streaming I'm going to just describe to you. One of them is known as the gifted education program, where those who are academically exceptional are up there, right? And then there is the express and special stream, where they are doing well academically, they are in this stream. And then we have those who are normal academic, they are average, they are academics, and so they are put into this stream. And finally, the normal technical, you should know, huh? usually you cannot make it, then you go into this stream. Right? Now what is interesting is that for those who are normal technical, most of them there are youth at risk. I won't say it's all. And I won't say just because you're normal technical, you are youth at risk. You could be a youth at risk, but you could be normal academic. You could be in other streams. But most of them are there. And you know what's the usual definition of a normal technical in Singapore? I have talked to teachers and friends. And the usual definition of a normal technical student is noisy, talkative, can't sit still. And the worst of all, stupid. I believe you will agree what I'm saying. And I wish today that your perceptions will change. Yet they are not stupid. In fact, your perceptions should change. They are more intelligent than what you know. Now, if you have heard about Howard Gardner, he came up with the theory of multiple intelligence. There are eight types of inter intelligence. Visual, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, so on and so forth. Right? So there are eight types of intelligence. And drawing three inspiration from his intelligence and putting my own three, let me package to you the intelligence of a youth at risk. Firstly, they are good in terms of verbal intelligence. They know how to argue. With their parents, with their teachers, they know how to argue. They have verbal intelligence. They have interpersonal intelligence. They are social beings. In classroom, teachers call them for talking. Because they are social beings, they love to talk. They can sit under the block, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and talk, and talk, and talk. Because they are interpersonal social beings. They have interpersonal intelligence. Thirdly, they have kinesthetic intelligence. They are smart in their hands, in their body. That's why they're put into this Institute of Technical Education. Not because they're stupid, but because it gives skills for them. Because they are bodily smart. Now, on top of what Gardner had brought in, let me bring in my three intelligence as well. They have high emotional intelligence. They have been hurt a lot in life. They know how to empathize. They know how to feel. They know how to care for people. They have a great heart. And on top of that, they have street intelligence. They are smart in terms of going to the streets. They are street smart. You put them there, they know how to survive. They are smart in their street intelligence. And finally, Resilient intelligence. When they go to school, they get scolded. Go back home, get scolded. See their friend, also get scolded. You see, in this whole process, what happens is that they are actually shaped by all these adversities and their hearts get stronger and stronger every day. And when they grow up, they become more and more resilient through this whole process. Right, so I just packaged to you a youth at risk based on intelligence alone. There are so much things I can talk about and bring the positive qualities of what a youth at risk is, rather than we always looking down on them. Now, let me share with you uh, one of my own story. These are my group of youths, and this is in Orchard Road, a prominent place in Singapore. Now, this group of youths have issues at home, have issues at school. They don't even go to school regularly. They go to school almost one to two days a week. Right? But then, the school gave, it, gave them to me, and I took them and started to work in their lives. And we took a creative approach. We actually tried to do something for National Day. And you know what we started to do? We created a music video. Because August 9 was Singapore's birthday. So we were at July. So we thought, okay, let's do a music video. And we worked very hard. We put the whole thing together. We talked about the issues of Singapore, the, the, the issues Singaporeans complain about, and how we should stand together and always support each other. Coming out from them, you know in the past, these are people who don't even care for themselves. But now to come up with the idea of caring for the country, I tell you, that's amazing. 
Now I'm going to show you the video, and it's only going to be the last part of the video because we don't have time. But I really hope you'll enjoy. And before I show you the video, I just want to tell you that the lyrics and the concepts come from them mostly, and shared with me. But we borrowed the music for from Usher. Right? Before Usher finds me, I better inform him. Right? So enjoy this one minute video. say why well, these guys don't deserve to be here but I say I'm proud of them and I dare to bring them on stage here to show everyone because I'm proud of them so out of the nine person who did the video four of them are here representative and I'm so happy that they're here I don't think they have ever wear tie before like this right in their life <laughs> and in this whole process not just the video in itself you know what else happened just before National Day we want to show it in the school I got permission to show it in the school. And they were happy because in this process, what they are going to get is respect. They feel they are going to be respected once again once the video is shown in school. But just two to three days before National Day, the school told me, sorry, we don't have a slot to put their video. I was crushed. I was devastated. But do you know what they told me? They told me, Mr. David, it's okay. We have already achieved success with what we have did. Talking about resilient intelligence, emotional intelligence, hats off to them. They restored me again. And then came Teacher's Day, just about that period. And usually for those who are in Singapore or beyond maybe, what you would receive as a teacher, it could be you know, either a pen, a card, maybe even a rose. Or it could be even a cake. Someone could buy a cake for them. But this group of youths, you know what they did? They spent hours and hours baking me an Oreo cheesecake. <laughs> 10 upon 10. Delicious to the max. I really enjoyed it. To bake an Oreo cheesecake, come on, this group of students, when they go to school, people are scared of them. But they don't see the value of them. And on top of that, in this process, they also presented me with this book. And you know what's in this book? It's memories. Page by page, memories. They go and print photos and share with me all the words, everything. Right? I just highlight here for you some of them. So many words. I will do this, and this is what we went through. I've learned this from you. So many beautiful things. This is one book I will never lose in my life. Let me just share one of them. There were so many nice things that were written. I'm just going to share just one, right, for the sake of making you more emotional. <laughs> Hi, Mr. David. I used to dislike motivation programs. I just feel it's a waste of time to a student like me, helpless and hopeless. 
But everything changed when we started this project. I really love this program. I came to become more confident and responsible. It's all because of you. Coming from them. This is one precious book. Now, my dear friends, it's time we change our perceptions. We don't wait for people to change. We don't wait for youth at risk to become normal again. Then we accept them. Start. We start changing our perceptions. And I believe every single one of you has potential to work in their lives. You don't have to go through what I went through to reach out to them. Anyone can reach out to them. They are like sparrows, but sparrows with broken wings. But they can be men. And they can soar again. More than what they can imagine. And more than what you have ever imagined. Thank you. Thank you.